Hi there, I'm Mabel Jong, and you're watching the World Healthcare Congress Interview Zone. I'm so pleased to have Dimitri Drone here. He's with PricewaterhouseCoopers, specializing in the life sciences area. Hi there, Dimitri. How you doing? Great, Mabel. Thanks for having me. Well, it seems like it seems like a very exciting time to be in this particular sector in healthcare, and you're very busy talking with clients about international transactions in the life sciences area. Tell me about your work. Well, one of the interesting things is that so many companies these days want to want to expand growth uh, strategies are very much driven by M&A and also uh, licensing and other types of transactions. But much of the focus that historically had been on, let's say, the U.S. or other more developed markets like Europe or Asia Pac is very much now directed to the emerging uh, economies as well as some of the frontier economies. I see. Now, what in particular are interesting in the emerging markets to American companies? So it's, in my mind, it's, it's effectively a land grab. So in other words, in the U.S. as well as some of the other more mature markets, there's a lot of well-established players that already kind of um, control the market. Whereas if you go to even the BRIC countries, there's still a lot that is evolving currently. And so to get in at the relatively early stages of it, you can experience, uh, I'll say, an above average amount of growth as a result of it. Give me an example of what country is particularly active now. Well, uh, certainly anyone and everyone has a China strategy. And for some, the strategy in China is to not be in China. But uh -huh. I would say that you need to consciously decide whether you want to operate in that country or not. And if you think about it, I think close to an eighth of the world's population is in China. So that's a lot of people to not to, you need, you need to consciously decide whether you want to operate in that country because of just the sheer number of people that are there. Okay, now operate in the country, producing in the country, and also selling in the country, or just producing and then bringing the product back here? Well, it could be any of the above. The reality is that the more that you want to have a presence in a country like China, the more that you probably need to have operations on the ground. And that likely means that you're going to need to, in all likelihood, either partner with somebody or buy into the to, to a pre-existing uh, company and infrastructure in that market. And is there an, an entire education uh, learning curve there, if you will, because the transparency and rules and regulations are very different, especially in a place like China. So there are some, some risk factors that you're taking on that you might not have to in other emerging areas. Oh, so I would say that emerging markets in general there's a much different uh, approach to, let's say, diligence and, and entering into the market than in the more mature markets. You know, one of the things that um, I think continually surprises people is that when they are successful at entering into a, to a particular country, one of the emerging markets, uh, they often find within the first six to 12 months that there's a significant amount of dis-synergies in the transaction. And what I mean by that is that the business practices of the company that they've partnered with or bought um, are quite different than what they've done in their own home market and they need to undo some of those practices to kind of conform to how they do it back home. Mm -hmm. And in doing so, they, they will often shave off 10, 20, 30 percent on the top line, which has even a more magnified effect on the bottom line. And what might, and what might look good on paper might be very different once you're on the ground. Very true. There. Very true. Uh, what, so let's get back to your expertise in really deciphering what is a good deal. Somebody else might scope out the deal, but they bring it to you to say, is this going to work? So um, the best deals are the ones that with hindsight end up you know, paying off, obviously. Now, for many companies, it's a case of, do you want to be in a country or not? And then if you do, it's often a case of, do you want to align yourself with one of the leader, one of the current leaders, one of the bigger players in that market? And the answer for most is yes. If you're going to go in, go in in a big way and partner with or acquire the dominant one or two or three, you know, one of the top, so let's say, two to four companies in that country. But of course, when doing so, that usually carries with it a very significant price tag. Mm -hmm. And why is this a particularly uh, interesting time with everything that's going on in healthcare now in the United States? Why might an international combination be put as a priority? So in the U.S., you have a multitude of, of the, the U.S. market historically had been the dominant market, and it still is. I think it's still in excess of 40 percent of the global market share is in the United States. But that being said, it's on the decline. And if you think about the U.S. market, unless you have a very innovative product, and in, in fact, if you look, the majority of the products where people are, are placing a fair amount of value on are orphan drugs, 
where we're catering to just very small patient populations, a couple thousand people, but you have the ability to price it at a level that enables you to recoup the investment. Mm -hmm. When we're talking about the more mainstream drugs, and let's say something that is not that different from what's already on the market, the pricing is, is not there. Mm -hmm. people, are, people are pulling the plug on drugs in their home market here in the U.S. when they can't demonstrate that it's significantly different than what's already on the market. Mm -hmm. And unfortunately, there haven't been very many that fit that category, mm -hmm. other than those that are orphan drugs. Now, when you layer on top of it the challenges in the U.S. market and then the significant, patient, the significant populations around the world, particularly in the BRIC countries, of you know, people that are um, uh, f experiencing increases in wealth, and with increases in wealth, they're often demanding you know, improvements in the healthcare, there's opportunity for them. So they say that it may be a very full price or a very um, you know, high multiple that one might pay to enter into that market, but they'll grow into it in uh -huh. the not too distant future. And do you have, uh, if you will, a favorite or a more of a, a, a country or emerging market that you would recommend would be a good idea? All right, so um, I'll be a little contrary and, and go with the notion of go where the puck is going to be not where it is currently, or where okay. the ball is going to be and not where it is currently. Okay. So almost everyone is talking about the BRIC countries, right? The Brazil, mm -hmm. um, Russia, India, and China. You also have Mer uh, Mexico and Turkey often thrown in the mix too. I've used the term, I used the term earlier about frontier markets, and yeah. so think of that as kind of the, the next tier. So think of like a South Africa or some of the other Asian countries, mm -hmm. like a Vietnam, Thailand, mm -hmm. Indonesia. Those are very attractive in my mind because the valuations may be more in line with what you might pay in a more developed market in terms of there's not everyone going after the same two or three or four companies. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. There, they're not getting the same level of interest yet. In a couple of years' time, I am guessing that they will have that level of interest. Sure. But if you can get in early, establish a foothold, you can get in at a reasonable price and have a better chance of earning a nice return on your investment. Very good. All right. Interesting stuff. Thank you so much, Dimitri. Thanks, Mabel. Thanks for stopping by. Sure. And I'm Mabel Zhang. Thanks for watching.